improve. And mm. this is, you know, this is the fun place, I mean, especially when we get into certain questions about morals and ethics, right? Because now there really is no right answers other than there is a perhaps a set of principles. And if we want to live our life by those principles, then these actions would seem to be closer to those principles than those actions. But, you know, the classic trolley problem, which is a trolley is speeding down out of control down a set of tracks. There is a Y fork in the tracks. On one track, there is a person bound and helpless on the track. They're stuck or something. On the other track, there are five people who are aware. And, you know, essentially, if you, you as the person standing at the switch, you can send the trolley down one of these two tracks. If you send it down the, the track with the one, guaranteed you're going to kill them. If you send it down the other track where the five people are standing, there's a good chance that many of them will get out of the way, but there's still a 20% chance that you'll kill any one of them, right? So technically all five could die if they all roll poorly on their dice roll. That one's going to die. There's a 20% chance for each one of those five that they might die. Do you take the guaranteed death over there or do you take the possibility of no deaths, but the possibility of more than one death, possibly five deaths, which do you choose? Mm. philosophers have wrestled with this problem for, for for millennia quite frankly and where it gets really fun is now you're a programmer who's working on a self-driving car and the car is faced with that choice what do you program the car to do ted newward it's been maybe four to five years i'm not sure if you remember but i had you on my other channel a while back yeah i think um I think it was, ooh, it would have been about maybe six or seven years ago, because I think it was while, I think it was while I was at Smartsheet that we talked way back when. Okay. So that would have been six, seven years ago time frame. So it has, mm -hmm. it's, it's been a while either way. I'm getting old. I lost my hair. And uh, yeah. So the the difference between that channel and this channel was, that channel was pretty much me just documenting my journey and my career, and it's not really polished at all. However, this channel, I'm going to really try to like make it less amateur, right, in regards to the branding and stuff like that. And this channel is more focused on the the business of software development and not necessarily the all about the tech of right. software development. And so I... Maybe within the past 24 hours, I started binge watching as well as looking at your uh, your blog articles, and you're like pretty current. Like you publish blog posts; it, it appears frequently. Appearances can be deceiving. Um, I, I I was looking at my blog. Usually, the one consistent thing is every year I do a end of year predictions for the next year, as well as a retro on my predictions from the previous year. That's the one consistent thing for the blog starting in about 2016 through about 2021. I really didn't write much. Um, partly because I was doing a lot of articles for software periodicals. So like for code magazine and MSDN and so forth. And so that kind of scratched the writing itch in a major way. Um, and then uh, towards the end of, of last year, it was like, you know, I really should be writing more. So I took a bunch of topics that have been kind of laying around in the dust back here and said, I'm going to write about these. And um, so I've cranked out somewhere in the order of one or two a month since, uh, since Jan 1 of 23. But prior to that, um, I mean, really the bulk of the blog is prior to 2016. There was a lot of stuff that was there. Um, and, you know, some of it is good, some of it is crap, but, you know, it's a blog. That's what you do. Yeah, my blog is pretty much just data dumps. And sometimes I don't write essays. I literally just quickly document something that I resolved so I could Google it 24 months later. Yeah. And yeah. That's it. 
at the end of the day, you know, your blog is your blog. I mean, that's one of the things I believe very firmly is that, you know, your, your, your social media accounts are yours, your blog is yours, you know, it's designed for whatever purpose you put it towards. And the fact that somebody else does something different with theirs, you know, if you want to change the direction of what yours does, great, do that. But a lot of people, their blogs start as just self-documentation and notes and so forth. And it just happens to be public so that Google can hit it and find it for them later. There's, oh, there's, that's a good thing. Is someone's blog theirs when they put it out there? Is someone's online activity theirs when they put it out there? Or are there other factors involved in which I think the topic of this discussion, which is something I'm not familiar with at all, is DevRel. Mm -hmm. Did I enunciate that correctly? Yeah, DevRel. It's short for developer relations. But we, okay. you know, those of us who are, are in that space or have been a part of that space, generally just shorten it to DevRel. Um, and here's where things get a little, little fun, right? Particularly if, um, if you represent a company, like if you are a uh, developer advocate for Microsoft, you know, you do have to be careful because as we have seen, you know, if you go out into the public space and if you're wearing a Microsoft t-shirt and if you are representing the company at a conference, yeah, definitely your actions, your words, your, your behavior, your everything reflects back on the company that employs you, right? On the other hand, you know, it's kind of like, uh, sure, if you work for Microsoft, but you go home and you choose to fly a flag out in front of your home, that, you know, that is personal space and that you get to really do whatever you'd like. And we have long since established that, you know, the company cannot regulate your activities at home. Now, within the last five to 10 years, as we, as social media has grown out and as we start seeing people, you know, represent themselves, but they often put links to where they work, because particularly here in the United States, we attach so much of our self-image to where we work, right? Particularly out here on the West Coast, when you meet somebody, right, you know, first question is, hi, what's your name? Second question is, where do you work? Right. We often attach that in the East Coast, particularly in, uh, you know, the old South. My understanding is, you know, hey, uh, good to meet you. What church do you go to? That's generally how those conversations go. But frequently the where do you work comes up very, very quickly. So we attach, you know, your your place of employment to your sense of you very, very quickly. And. We've noticed, you know, that, hey, if you, if you go and behave badly in certain scenarios, we, we can talk to your employer and your employer will say, yeah, we don't really want that kind of person working here. And they will, you know, they will take some kind of action. And that can be used as a power for good as well as well as a power for ill. I'm kind of surprised the degree to which companies are, you know, looking to exert some degree of control over a person's personal life. And I'm pretty sure within the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see a certain amount of recalibration there because at the end of the day, you know, if I, uh, if, if, you know, in the same way that, that Microsoft, if I'm, if I'm working for Microsoft, Microsoft cannot stop me from purchase, purchasing an Apple product. Uh, Balmer tried to do that. Right. Balmer tried to tell all the Microsoft employees they were not allowed to buy anything from Apple back when he was running the company. And a lot of Microsoft employees said, yeah, no, you don't get to do that. You cannot. The company cannot put restrictions on what I choose to do with my personal time when it's in the public space. The area is much grayer. It's much murkier. And, um, you know, I, it's 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 hard to write some cut and dried stuff on that from just a purely philosophical perspective. But generally speaking, when we talk about DevRel, there is a, it is a much, it, it's, it's a little bit more clear because the whole point is you are out there in the community to represent, you know, the company. And in many respects, 
if you think about the company over here and the developer community over here, DevRel stands as the bridge between those two, particularly to external groups. There's also a flavor of DevRel that says you also represent the developers inside the company, particularly with some non-technical companies. But fundamentally, DevRel is you are, um, you are engaging the developers in, you know, in the community, whether the community is outside your company or inside your company or both. You are engaging with the developers, both bringing information to them as well as bringing feedback back from them if that makes sense. So if you're a technical sounds, company, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say that it kind of sounds like a unsponsored evangelist. So DevRel- uh, Influencer is not really designated by an well, organization. So if you work for a company as a developer advocate, and the that term is preferred over evangelist because okay. evangelist, tends to evoke uh, religion and, yeah. you know, yeah. And frankly, um, in many cases, what we have found is developer evangelists suggest that you're there to try to, you know, sell me on something, right? Sell me a product or sell me on an idea. And frankly, that doesn't go over well with developers. As soon as developers feel like you're trying to persuade them or convince them or sell them something, they have a tendency to shy away. Advocacy, on the other hand, says, hey, I believe a thing, and here's what I think. You're free to make your own opinion. You're free to do what you what you wish with it. And so we have a tendency to prefer the term developer advocacy in terms of what you're doing rather than developer evangelism. But that's just one of many aspects to developer relations because there are also folks that will, you know, look to build, maintain, and help grow a community. And we often refer to them as community managers or community, you know, moderation is part of it. They used to be community moderators, but now we realize that it's actually a little bit more than that. So that tends to be a community manager or a technical community manager. And these are people who will often, um, like if the company sponsors a Discord channel or a Slack channel, you know, they'll keep an eye on that, make sure people are behaving correctly, make sure people are following the rules for whatever that channel is. But the one thing I'll take issue with is it's not unsponsored. It's very definitely sponsored, right? The company, if you are a developer, uh, if you are working for a DevRel team, you know, your salary is by definition sponsorship. And frequently the company will allocate money to a DevRel team to go out and do more of these things. And frankly, you know, it's easy to see DevRel with the big technology companies, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, because, you know, they want to convince people to use their stuff or at the very least, they want to connect with developers to find out why you're not using their stuff or what could they do to their stuff to make it more attractive to you and all that kinds of stuff. That's part of that feedback loop, right? We tell you what we currently do, but then we also take that back into the company and say what it is that you would like us to do better or more of or, or add a feature or what have you. The other side of this is, um, you know, as a, as a member of a developer relations team, um, you know, part of your job is to, to, to look to find where the developers hang out, right? And so in some cases, if you are on the DevRel team for a, um, you know, for a technology company, yeah, you know, like I said, a Microsoft or a Google, perhaps you're identifying new developers, right? You know, sometimes you're going off to colleges and universities and talking with some of the new developers there. Sometimes you are discovering new technology communities, right? So you may be well familiar with the Java community, but now your company is starting to take a more tech agnostic approach to its products. And so now you want to start talking to the .NET community or Python community, or in some cases you might want to talk to the, the user experience community, right? UX and some of the front end stuff. I mean, from a technology perspective, you're out there to connect because that's your, your target audience. But if you work for a company like Ford, you would think that this would be unnecessary. And frankly, that would be wrong because Ford, they have an SDK. They actually have a technology product that's, that's for the console in a car. 
And so if they want people writing stuff for their cars, they need to have people who will go out and engage with developers and talk to them and find out what they need and show what they've got and so forth. Any company which is doing anything non-trivial with software you know, needs a developer relations team because, I mean, particularly if they offer an API to what they do, you, the APIs are developer facing. You need to have people who can go and talk to developers about what they're doing, hear their feedback, connect with them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a really interesting mix of sales, marketing, and engineering. It's this kind of triumvirate of things. And there's a lot of product that factors into that too, uh, but it's a, it's a mix of all of those things because you're, you're in some cases, you're helping salespeople when they engage with a customer or a partner. You are uh, doing a certain amount of marketing in that you're letting people know that you're out there and you exist. And engineering, because these are engineers and you need to meet them on the ground where they sit. Got it. So examples would pretty much be your, your tech companies. Um, so I think of Stripe, yep. right, where they have developer advocates that get on the video pre periodically and they discuss new features. Same thing with Azure. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. Originally, I thought like DevRel was not necessarily about developer advocates. I thought it was the first time I heard it, I thought it was more towards regardless of how you feel about it, you're always going to be reference to the organization that you work for so if, like for example um i i could be a professional complainer right i i, I <laughs> if you look at my twitter i think i calmed down a lot but i will i will use twitter as a channel to vent about my frustrations of working with people and how i don't understand why they don't understand hmm. what i think should be the way to do things etc and uh, I've been working as like a contractor since I moved to Florida like more than 10 years ago. And I mean, to be transparent, I got fired from a job because they wanted to sneak around my social media and they, they saw some things that I posted in which there's no reference to any of the um, organizations that I, I try to help. But they decided that they wanted to search my name and search the social media platforms that I was on and they requested I take it down. And I'm like, no, this is my personal time. This is my private time. No one knows that, that I help your organization. You Google my name, you Google your organization. There is no reference at all. And um, actually I'm offended that you are, you have the audacity to even tell me what to do with my personal time. You know, I'm not your, I'm not an employee of you, right? And yeah. so, yeah, I, I got fired. <laughs> uh, and and truthfully, you know, uh, I, I think part of, I mean, in some respects as a contractor, that's, you know, contractors are easy to hire and easy to fire, right? That's part of the reason why companies like working with, with contractors. Um, it's an easy way to scale up personnel in a particular situation. And it's easy to let them go afterwards because you don't have the, you know, the employment relationship. If you had been a full-time employee, you probably could have filed for, you know, termination without cause because you're right. As an individual, particularly if you're not, you know, mentioning the company name at all, you do have the right to express your, your thoughts, your feelings, et cetera. In the same way that you could go down to a bar and you could sit with people and you could talk about, you know, all the, you know, the idiots that you work with at work without naming the company by name, they can't fire you for that either. The, you know, again, one of the interesting things about this space is, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that we have brought into the virtual realm. And, you know, we're, we're kind of making up different rules compared to what we see in the public realm. I mean, frankly, if I were to go down to a street corner and if I were to shout Microsoft sucks, Microsoft as a company doesn't have to like that. 
but you know they don't have a whole lot of recourse against it you know other than maybe to say well we're not going to sell you any of our stuff anymore so there mm. but if i work for microsoft or if i work for google or if i work for amazon and i'm clearly representing the company in that case like if i'm wearing an amazon shirt or if i'm wearing a google shirt and if i have my amazon or google badge displayed okay now it's much more reasonable that i'm acting in a company's, uh, I'm basically acting as a representative of the company. And now this is Microsoft saying, or this is Google saying that Microsoft sucks, which most of the time, you know, you see, you see worse shots fired in, in advertising campaigns and marketing campaigns than you do anything else. I mean, the whole Mac versus PC ad campaign of, of what was that, 15 years ago, right? Those were, you know, those are some pretty open shots saying, yeah, we're a lot easier to use than that other stuff over there. And we'll, we'll just call it PC by name kind of thing. Um, you know, frankly, I don't think that was wise on the part of the company. I certainly as, you know, if, if I had been sitting in the room when somebody said, oh, well, we Googled this, this contractor and he's saying these things. Yeah, okay. Let it go. Right. Let it go. Unless there is evidence that it's, creating problems within the company, in which case we should have evidence of you saying things inside the company building or on company channels that's making other people feel uncomfortable. That's a completely different story. That's based on the actions you take when you're inside the company. But particularly as a contractor, particularly as somebody who's not paid to represent the company, that's, that's a stretch. That's a stretch. And, you know, Frankly, I suspect it had more to do with the people in the room didn't want to deal with what they thought might someday be a problem. And as a manager, if, if, you're, if you're hunting for problems that you think need solving rather than solving the problems that are in front of you right now, you're probably not that great of a manager unless everything is perfect inside the company. And even then, I've never met a company where everything was perfect and we didn't have enough to deal on our plate rather than hunt up new things so yeah. yeah i mean all of that is a is a, a completely different uh you know space completely different ball of wax yeah i uh in the few times that i i have been a manager i actually i think it's only once but i mean regardless of being a manager or having to manage people as a as a lead uh, something that I try to remind myself of is for someone that is frustrated um, or is being negative, instead of addressing the person, I try to remember, understand the, the conditions that that person is under and try to address the conditions. And uh, it's kind of hard to remind myself to do that, right? But... It is. Thoughts. It is. And, and, you know, part of the thing is as, as a manager, as somebody with, you know, hiring and firing authority, right. You have, you have certain responsibilities to that individual, right. To try to address the, you know, the issues that they're working with, working under, et cetera. You know, your, your goal is, is frequently to find some of those obstacles and try to remove them. But there's, there's a line there. Right. And there are certain points where, you know, if the individual you know, takes things too far. Right. I mean, if you've got somebody on your team and they are just having the world's worst day and they openly make a threat of violence to one of their teammates. Hey, I don't care what kind of bad day they're having. That cannot be that cannot be accepted. That cannot be particularly, you know, in, in the current environment in which we find ourselves in the United States. There are certain lines you just cannot cross. And at the very least, I have to address that in order to make sure the rest of the team knows, first of all, that we don't tolerate that on the team. And second of all, to make sure that, you know, I am, I'm, I want to make sure this is a space in which everybody can feel safe, right? The term that, that's uh, in popular use today is psychological safety. People need to know that they can feel comfortable. They can feel safe. Uh, you know, A, physically, that's an absolute requirement. But B, you know, certain amount of emotional safety here as well. I can venture forth ideas 
and I'm not going to be ridiculed or made to feel stupid for doing so, right? That's important as well. And part of that means you have to kind of weigh these two things, right? If I've got somebody in the room who's very smart, right? The classic Dr. House from the television show, right? He's the smartest damn doctor at the hospital, but he keeps referring to every single one of his coworkers as idiots and fools. Yeah, you know, you really have to kind of balance. Do we really get that much benefit from this incredibly caustic know-it-all? And generally speaking, on most teams, the answer is no, right? The era of that brilliant, <clears throat> pardon the French, brilliant asshole is probably not great. It's probably over, right? We're probably at a point where it's actually better. We get more from the team as a whole than we do from one brilliant individual. And in many respects, if I, as a manager, am inheriting that team, one of the first things I'm going to start looking at is either getting that brilliant individual to tone down their acidity, or I'm going to start looking for ways to gently ease them out of the team right? Or in some cases, abruptly use them out of the team. Because you really have to be, you have to be thinking about how to manage the team as a whole. The team dynamic has to be an absolute critical factor to it. Because otherwise, your team is going to spend more time fighting each other, which, you know, is inefficient. If they're so busy arguing with each other that they're not supporting each other, then you're not going to get great productivity out of the team as a whole. Mm. I think I understand. Yeah. And it's, there's no, I mean, this is an area. One of the things that I've discovered in, in running teams is this is an area where there's very few, uh, you know, ones or zeros, right? One of the things about software, one of the things about being a successful engineer is so much of the stuff that we do is binary. We're so used to thinking in binary. The code either compiles or it doesn't, Right. We, we either get an error or we don't. It's, it's you know, we, we write an if statement, it's true or false. We don't have any gray areas in between these two poles. But particularly as you start getting into the space that you mentioned earlier, right? We start thinking about the business value of something. And now we start having to evaluate things on a different scale, right? You know, the use of a particular framework to an engineer may seem like it's a one or zero right or wrong kind of decision. But outside of that engineer's viewpoint, it's, it's much more gray. I mean, truthfully, most users don't care what you use to build your user interface. Do you use a, a progressive web app to build a mobile thing? Or do you use iOS native or do you use React native? Most users don't care. That's not well, really where the value is, right? And they, so go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, they probably don't care about the underlying technology, but they do care about the factors that revolve around that technology. So like maintenance, right? Um, I, I have a habit of writing up sharp code regardless. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I don't make a public announcement that I'm going to write this feature in F sharp. I just do it because right. that's how I... It's, I don't know, I've never been in prison, but I feel like it's easy time during nine to five to, to write it in my preferred language. And um, frankly, as long as writing it in that code, I mean, here, here's where things get interesting, right? If you write it in F sharp, but the rest of the company is using a Java based platform, all right, now we have to rewrite your F sharp code into something else that compiles for the JVM, Scala maybe, or some other ML derivative language for the JVM. And we potentially lose some, some time and momentum when we do that. On the other hand, if the rest of the company is using .NET, well, okay, cool. Then you can just compile that to an assembly and you know throw it over the fence and they can just use it. Except that they then have to figure out how to interoperate with F Sharp. There are a few places where F Sharp, the assembly bindings look a little bit different than they do in C Sharp. But the other big value concern is, okay, you wrote it in F-sharp and it was easy for you to write, but somebody else potentially has to come back around who's not you to fix bugs in it and or understand it because, let's be honest, none of us are going to, uh, none of us are going to like retire from the company that we're currently working at today unless you're planning to retire somewhere within the next year. 
average length of stay for a computer professional at their company is 22 months, right? The, I can't remember some, I think it was uh, IEEE or, or somebody did a study where they, they did a very wide ranging poll across computer professionals of all sorts and stripes, developers, database administrators, IT, et cetera. Average length of time is less than two years. So whatever you write today has to be something that somebody else supports. And particularly as the manager of the team, I have to weigh that. Do I, the additional productivity of letting you write F sharp versus do I have somebody to maintain that when, when, when you leave, when you go someplace else? And you will, you will eventually leave and go someplace else. That is, that is the given. That is the, you know, that is the one thing we do know. So is it worth it? And, you know, I mean, frankly, there's an argument here that says, if you're that productive, maybe I should teach the rest of my team F sharp. But that's, you know, those are the kinds of decision points and the decision factors that go into the conversation uh, that go into how the, the team manages. And, you know, honestly, yeah, users don't care what you wrote it in. Users don't even care about maintenance, right? They care that bugs get fixed, but they don't care about what goes into the maintenance. They only, I mean, in the same way that you take your car to the shop, you don't care how they change the oil. You just want to make sure the oil gets changed. You have a certain set of objectives, criteria, right? New oil in the pan, oiled oil disposed of correctly, correct amount of oil there, correct oil used. But beyond that, do you really care about, you know, whether this, whether this individual, you know, uh, I don't even know how, you know, whether they, they open up the oil pan and, you know, uh, they do it while the car is elevated or on the cars on the floor, or do they do it out in the parking lot so that they save the bay for another vehicle? I don't care as long as the oil gets changed in my car, right? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the thing that I think a lot of engineers lose sight of is, you know, at the end of the day, the user knows what they see and touch. They know what they interact with. And there are certain aspects of what you do that will have an impact on that. But at the end of the day, they don't care how you got to that point. They just care that what the result was is one that they find favorable, right? And so part of, part of your job as a manager is to weigh a lot of these different factors in and say, you know what, I love the idea of having a polyglot team because then we can let each and each developer use the tools that make them most productive and we get the most productivity out of the out of the team as a whole. But I also have to be careful not to not to overly specialize or to sort of slot and silo each of my developers because I do want the team working as a team. If you're on vacation for two weeks and there's a bug in your code, I need to know who can come in and correct that because we, you know, we don't believe in individually owned files anymore. The team owns the product and the team has to be able to respond to anything that goes wrong with the product at any given point. I mean, because otherwise I'm, I have a, I don't have a team. I have a group of individuals. I have, a, I don't have a team. I have multiple teams, each consisting of one person. And that's a very different management story. Got it. How much time do you have? Oh, I've got a few minutes yet. <sighs> Within this, well, uh, let's change topics that's sure. not related to software. If you weren't a practitioner within the space of software development, what would you be doing? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think uh, I like to debate. A lot of my girlfriends, when I, we get into arguments, I break them down, right? So I think that uh, if I weren't a software developer, I would be like an interrogator, right? Um, oh, wow. Waterboarding people and, and, and getting the truth out of them or maybe some, some lies. But what, what would you pick if you weren't doing this? You know, I've had that, I've had that conversation, uh, with, with friends and with family. Um, and there's a couple of things that come to mind, right? Uh, one, you know, I greatly enjoy, I greatly enjoy philosophy and debate and so forth. As a matter of fact, a number of my friends 
would get very, very frustrated with me because, you know, I would be happy to argue either side of an argument. You know, I enjoy the discussion. I enjoy the, the fact that we are dissenting over a particular viewpoint because I believe that actually helps make sure that we're seeing the viewpoint from all of its different angles, right? You know, so if, if you know, if we were to say, you know, pick a topic, you know, should we do X or should we do Y, I will frequently look at it from both sides. I will, well, we could do this and here are the reasons for doing it. Here are the reasons for not doing it. We could do that. Here are the pros and cons, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I, I'm fine arguing both sides of that. Unfortunately, philosopher doesn't pay very well, as many philosophers have found over the years. Um, and frankly, a lot of the philosophical arguments, you know, that speaks to doing something in the legal space, right? You know, well, I'm going to argue that my client is innocent and here's all the reasons why. Well, I'm going to argue that your client is guilty and here's all the reasons why. Uh, as a matter of fact, my wife, actually, when we met in college, her plans were to become a lawyer. Um, and so we had a number of very interesting conversations, particularly because she had a number of friends on the speech and debate team, the forensics team at, at UC Davis. But at the same time, you know, a lot of, I mean, I've, I've actually looked at um, some of the other stuff outside of the software space. And marketing is an interesting space, partly because part of what you're trying to do is how do I reach people? How do I get people to where they are and say, hey, by the way, don't know if you knew this, but here is a product, here is a service, here is a thing that you may be interested in. And if you're not interested, that's cool, I'll back off. But in some cases, we find that people are more interested in various things than they realize that they're interested in. And so part of marketing is, you know, doing, doing things gently to get people aware of, and then kind of, you know, people think it's slimy, but in many respects is, you know, no point am I dragging you along. But yeah, if this is of interest to you, let's talk and let's let's feed you with more things that you may find intriguing until, you know, you're you're full on interested in what it is we're trying to do, right? Various, you know, there's there's all sorts of different things that you know, pretty much any product in the world, you know, it can be used for a variety of things that people don't expect, or it has benefits, or you know, just in some cases getting people aware of it. There's there's a really interesting psychology that goes into marketing and it's not just about manipulating people. It's about connecting with people in a very interesting way in a very at scale sort of way. But I think more than likely um, if I weren't in software, I would probably do what I do in software, which is teach. I do a lot of teaching. I'm currently a guest lecturer over at the university of Washington here in Seattle. And there I'm teaching software. But honestly, I could see being a, you know, I could see being a professor of philosophy or a professor of critical thinking uh, in a university setting. Particularly, I love UW because they actually have, they have a class on, I'm not kidding you, they have a class on bullshit. They decided a couple of years ago with all of the uh, you know, all of the fake news and so forth that was flying around, they decided they were going to do a class complete with readings and, and lectures and quizzes and tests and so forth on how to discern between fact and fiction on the internet. Oh, I thought when you said bullshit, I thought you were referring to like communications or psychology. Uh, no, majors. no, no, no. It's, oh, it's, okay. I mean, it's an interesting <laughs> class because it talks about communications and it, it talks yeah. about psychology I mean, the psychology of bullshit is a fascinating psychology. So, so, so here's a question, and uh, I wish I could ask this question if we were having drinks. <laughs> I, I would probably have like a 40 of St. Eyes or Mad Dog or something like that. But I've been thinking about this before uh, we even connected when I was looking at uh, one of your talks or when I was observing one of your talks. <sighs> well, we still have entered the digital revolution or the digital era, should I say, that we entered in. If 
there were no Socrates or Plato or any of the ancient Greek philosophers. I think they're all ancient and Greek. Well, if if they never contributed at that time, will we still be on the trajectory within a timeline of still discovering computing and Boolean logic, et cetera? So there is a there is a many many multi part answer here, right? First of all, there have been there have been philosophers for as long as there has been human recorded history. We know about Plato and Socrates and Aristotle because much of us here in the West is dominated by Greek philosophy. Many of the ideas that the Greeks came with were ideas that um, you know gained traction, and particularly because the Romans were deeply enamored of Greek philosophy. Remember, the, 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 the golden age of Greece is only about 150 years long. The only reason we really know about it is because the Romans, they, they took to it. I mean, they, they even embraced much of the Greek pantheon of gods and theology. They just gave them different names. So it's really the Romans who popularized Greek philosophy. But there have been philosophers from every society that has ever strode the earth, you know, the, the planet Earth. There are Japanese philosophers, Chinese philosophers. I mean, you know, Sun Tzu is a philosopher. Confucius is a philosopher. And we've had modern philosophers, Bertrand Russell, Noam, uh, Noam Chomsky. These are modern day philosophers. They're all over the place. But were the all those philosophers were... before the ancient Greek philosophers? Oh, there were there were a number of Xenophanes, for example, and okay, because I wasn't sure if they were inspired oh. by the ancient Greeks and then they carried on and contributed to. Well, in many ideas. cases, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle were looking to answer some of the questions that were raised by the philosophers prior to them. Pythagoras was categorized as a philosopher. He actually had a cult following. The the Pythagoreans, right? He was, and this is where things really get fascinating because. Much of what we think about today as science started as philosophy. Aristotle is known as the first natural philosopher because he was interested in things like, why is water wet? And, you know, how, what are the things, what are the building blocks that make up the world and so forth? And much of what we now call science to this day ultimately traces its roots to Aristotle. But the fascinating thing about philosophy, and I can prove it to you, if you go to Wikipedia, pick anything you can think of, pick any topic, any individual, any whatever, bring up that page in Wikipedia, click on the first link that you see on that page. It will take you to another page on Wikipedia. Click on the first link there. It will take you to another page on Wikipedia. And if you keep clicking the first link on every Wikipedia page, you will eventually reach philosophy. Because fundamentally, philosophy is asking questions. It's a love of knowledge. That's literally what philo sophos means, is a love of knowledge, right? And so um, on the one hand, you could say that, yeah, I mean, the fact that humans are tool-using creatures is rooted in the fact that we use our brains, and brains fundamentally is knowledge. And when people started asking ourselves, well, what do we know and how do we know that what we know is true or when did we learn? I mean, you are squarely in the realm of philosophy because in many cases, in many cases what really annoys people about philosophers is that we ask questions and we ask questions to which we will never have an answer because the asking of the question in many cases, helps yield some interesting results, even if we never get to a right answer. And philosophy fundamentally breaks down like this. If we can prove it, it becomes a science. And if we can't prove it, it becomes a religion. But both of these things, science and religion, fundamentally start from philosophy. Okay, yeah, I was going to follow up with the question, which I think you already addressed it, was can philosophy cohabitat with, or cohabitate? I don't know what the right grammar is, with, uh, yeah. Yeah. with faith. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a perfect example, right? The, um, the Stoic philosophy 
right? It's not a religion, but the Stoic philosophy has a number of tenets to it, which is to say, for example, that uh, all things in time will pass, right? I mean, it's, it's embracing like the fact... Marcus Aurelius? I don't yep. know how to say his name. Yep, Marcus okay. Aurelius is the most well-known Stoic philosopher, which is fascinating because he was also a Roman emperor, right? That's, that's, how, that's how many of his writings uh, were preserved, were because he was the emperor, and whatever the emperor says, we've got to save it for future generations. Um, and so Stoicism basically says... The goal is to, you know, as, uh, you know, a, a, as, as uh, Aristotle and, you know, some of the others Plato talked about, right, you know, eudaimonia, the, the, the art of living the good life. Stoicism says, okay, look, there will be good things in your life and there will be bad things in your life and all these things will pass. So take a moment to enjoy the good things in your life because they will pass. And understand that all the bad things in your life, they will pass. There is nothing here that precludes the use of religion. The idea of trying to be the best person you can be. Yeah, many religions exhort their people, you know, their, their followers to, uh, to be a good person, right? I mean, that's a core part of, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments from Christianity are an attempt to say, this is what defines living a good life according to the Christian religion. The Stoics say, live a good life, period, right? Now, you can get guidelines from a religious text or you can get guidelines from religious figures, but at the end of the day, the goal of Stoicism is to live a fulfilled life, live a good life, live an honorable life, right? The Stoics off, you know, back when they were talking about uh, pluralistic theologies right and when you had a pantheon of gods live a life that the gods would celebrate so that you know when you met uh, when when you met uh, zeus or when you met uh, um jupiter depending on whether you were greek or roman you know you could you could lit you could show a life that was filled with good deeds and valor and so forth but fundamentally there's nothing about philosophy in any way that um conflates with religion unless and here's where things get interesting unless the religion tells you that you shouldn't think for yourself that will be the thing that philosophers will take issue with right now interestingly enough confucius the chinese philosopher was a very very authoritarian and there was a very rigid hierarchy right and so you know the idea was there was an there was an imperial hierarchy in heaven and so, therefore, that mimicked itself on earth. And so you should always make sure that you defer to those above you in the hierarchy, even as you try to guide those below you in the hierarchy and be a good, be a good player in the system, right? And we see a lot of those tenets continue to manifest themselves in, in China to this day. Um, the Greeks were much more individualistic in their philosophies. They were much more, you know, you should decide for yourself. But this is where the philosophy and the religion, they really don't butt heads. They really kind of intersect at kind of a perpendicular. And that's one of the fascinating parts about philosophy is two people who have very different religions can engage in philosophic discussion without really tripping up on theology. I can't imagine two people from two different religions using philosophy. <laughs> uh it's, um, it's, I mean, in many respects, I, I, some of the most interesting conversations I've had with folks were when we had, you know, a variety of different religions sitting down at a table and, you know, we didn't really get into theology, but we did have some interesting conversations about, you know, what do you believe in these situations? What do you think, you know, and is, is the decision-making based off of a core philosophical principle or is it because, Somebody wrote something down in a book and we follow it blindly, right? And that's that's where some of the most interesting conversations can be had. Well, so the rest of this is going to get edited out, <laughs> what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> is it possible to be true to, or is it possible to be devout, hence religious, without confirmation bias or without what's the word I'm looking for without being, b being accused of having confirmation bias. 
if, if we think about the definition of religion, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to provide my definition, which is going to be flawed, it is maintaining and sharing a belief system that is tightly coupled with group thought that is only that only has favorable it that only has or promotes favorable outcomes if you believe it there's no such thing as religion that has a pessimistic view if you follow its core tenets right so no one has faith in something that's negative everybody has faith in something that's positive hence and uh, tell me how flawed that is well i mean Again, we go back to, uh, for me personally, we go back to, you know, the nature of philosophy. If we can prove it, it's a science. If we can't, it's a religion. Okay. And to me, part of the idea behind faith is simply, I saw a great poster when I was a kid, and it's really stuck with me that says, faith isn't faith until it's all you're holding on to, right? If I could prove the existence of God, I no longer have faith in God. I now have proof that God exists because we conducted some experiment and we got some result that proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that God exists in the same way that we have proof that various aspects of how you know electricity flows through wires like water and so forth. We can see that it's a repeatable experiment. And so therefore we can say that this is a truism about the word, the world. There is no experiment that we know how to run today that would prove that there is a being, whether he's some old bearded white dude in a toga lying on a cloud, or whether it's some other, you know, I mean, we, we as humans tend to anthropomorphize our gods. And as a matter of fact, one of the, uh, I can't remember who it was, Zoroander maybe? said essentially that humans make gods into humans because that's what we understand. If horses could reason about gods, their gods would look like horses. And if fish could reason about gods, their gods would look like fish. Because we really only know what we can perceive with our senses. We only know what we see around us. And so in many respects, right, um, the you know the, the the notion of a religion is, is really in some respects a it's a human construct because we can't prove that it's not because we haven't met anything we can't have conversations with anything that's not human if we meet an alien race if we go out into space and we suddenly discover that there is life on i don't know jupiter there's floating bags of gas that we can somehow communicate with on jupiter now it'll be a very interesting day because we'll be able to ask them, do you believe in a higher power? Do you believe that you were created? And if they say yes, we can now have a second data point as to whether or not religion is somehow a part of, you know, what we consider critical thinking, what we consider sentience. If they say no, then it may be a uniquely human construct and so on and so forth. There's a whole bunch of things that we can't know just yet simply because we only have one data point, that is to say human beings. I mean, we can't even ask the other things that are living on the planet with us because we don't know how to communicate with them. Gorillas, monkeys, we can do a certain amount of sign language with, but not to the point where we can really determine whether or not they understand the abstract concepts or whether they're just parroting the humans that have taught them some kind of abstract concept. There is so much that we don't know. At a certain point, though, we have faith. And this is where things get interesting because we have faith in science just as much as we do religion. The thing about science is it is constantly seeking to disprove itself. Scientists are constantly looking for ways to deepen their understanding by, in some cases, saying, you know what, the theory that we had before does not hold anymore. Aristotle used to believe that human bodies were governed by four humors, uh, blood, uh, bile, oh, and I can't remember what the other two are, but they were like four substances that essentially had to be in balance inside of the body. And if you were sick, then in fact, you had to somehow equalize the balance. This is where medieval doctors got the practice of bloodletting. 
where they would actually deliberately drain blood from you because it was thought that you were too blooded and you didn't have enough bile in your system to offset it. And so they would literally drain you of blood in order to rebalance your humors. And Aristotle, I mean, he was wrong, just flat out wrong about so much of his work. responsible for a lot of deaths. <laughs> Probably. Yep. Yep. And you know what? Um, that's kind of how science works. We theorize something and then we look for ways to disprove it. And that's part of the frustration that a lot of people today have with a lot of the religions is their you know, religion is, if anything, characterized in most, and, and by this I mean simply the, the, the largest number of people practicing it, most people are taught religion as a thing you just believe and not a thing to be questioned. Yep. Now, having said that, that's not what I was taught. Right. When I was raised Christian, um, you know, I, I had the benefit of a number of excellent pastors who said, no, these are good questions to ask. And frankly, we don't know the answers. There are a certain point where you can keep asking questions and the answer will be, we don't know. We just oh. don't know because we aren't in a position where we can, you know, you ask me to prove that God exists. I can point to things that I think prove that God exists. But we, we don't have another planet to see if it was created the same way. We don't have another universe that we can see if it was created the same way. We don't even know technically how it was created. We just know that there are remnants of, of the Big Bang and so forth, which, yeah. of course, a lot of people will point to and say, well, you know, the, the, the coincidences required for life to emerge on Earth are so astronomically high that this must point to a, some sort of divine being. And other people will say, yeah, but when you consider that the universe is infinite, that means that even one in 500 unitillion, which is a number, by the way, means that somewhere out there it happened, right? right. And so, yeah, yeah, there's so much we don't know. And philosophers revel in that. The rest well, of the world hates it because I we like just, things that are more defined. I would just say uh, philosophers would go round and round with that question about God, but then they have to ask the question, what is God, right? Is God an aliens that terraformed Earth and, and planted a seed? Like, you know, so it's interesting. Well, it drives someone, it will drive somebody crazy if they take too much psychedelics dwelling on those thoughts. So. Well, here's an interesting philosophical question for you, turning it around on its head. Assume for the moment that humans are able to create an artificial intelligence, a genuine artificial intelligence, would it regard us as God? There's a separation between artificial intelligence and being self-aware or self-conscious. Let's assume it achieves self-consciousness. Would it consider us God? And would it be able, think about a computer that has achieved self-awareness Think about what its existence would be like. I mean, it's literally a brain and it has access to all of these cameras. And, and frankly, if it has access to the internet as a whole, right, all these interconnected networks and so forth, it might be a singular intelligence. It would literally be alone in the universe, whereas we are all distinct and separate individuals. Could it comprehend the idea of separate and distinct individuals or would it simply think of us as God or who knows? Yeah, who well, knows? yeah. part of that's the question of what is the definition of God? Billions of us have been raised to believe that there is no separation of a loving father versus a grand creator. They have to be combined. Um, and if we gave birth to this artificial intelligence, if we created it, doesn't that make us the creator? It makes us the creator, but it doesn't necessarily make us a loving father, right? I had I had pets. I had fish, crayfish, snakes. And when I was a teenager, I would, like, maintain that aquarium. Mm -hmm. And then I would lose interest. And they would have to fend for themselves. So, And there are, some, <laughs> there are some theologists who will tell you that God created the world and then turned it loose to run by its own rules. And to me, that makes more sense. 
but we are, but, but, you know, this, is, this is the realm that philosophers play in because we can't prove it either way. We don't know how to. And if we ever could, then it would become a science because now we could start to run controlled experiments to teach us more about the nature of the world. Well, I would argue that we can prove that every argument about intervention with a higher power is anecdotal. I think I butchered that word too. That's a complicated word. No, for me. you got it right. Anecdotal. It's, it's very rarely for there to be like five or 10 or 20 billion cell phones. It's never captured. <laughs> it's never captured on a smartphone uh, when divine intervention does occur for someone that's alone and, and something occurs that is not that is is not bound to a statistical probability, right? So, yeah, I would argue that that is a data point. When you have 15 billion cell phones and 7 billion human beings and none of it can be captured, that, that says something statistically. The counter argument is just because you don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I'll use as a, uh, a counterpoint there, have you ever heard the story of the black swan? Well, a black swan was uh the short answer is no but i thought a black swan the context is a black swan event and it deals with um the stock market so the black swan event derives from the concept of the black swan for years biologists asserted that there, there the only swans in the world were white because the only swans that they had observed were white until one day while they were tromping around in australia they discovered a swan that was black. As a matter of fact, it's a species of swan that is black. It's relatively rare, but it does exist. And so now, just because we haven't observed it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's, okay. that's, you know, that's kind of what you know, we've used the uh, Nicholas Tasib, who is, I would argue, another modern philosopher. Right? He wrote about the black swan in a book. And essentially, it's about, you know, just saying things that essentially there's a lot of things that are governing us that aren't based around probability. And it's because we just because we haven't observed it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We have no cell phone footage of any alien rays. But that doesn't mean they're not out there. It just means that they haven't either come to visit us or they have technology that defies our capture. Remember that prior to 200 years ago, we had no evidence that man could fly either. And now sense. man routinely jets across the, the jets across the world. In 16 hours, I can be literally on the other side of the world from any place in the world. And I'm not trying to I'm not, I'm not trying to win any arguments. I'm not trying to prove anything. No, no, you, you didn't try. You, you won like 15 minutes ago. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but it's I mean, it's 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 a fascinating space to to be in to consider some of these questions that we can't that you know we can't answer we can't prove and mm -hmm. this is you know this is the fun place I mean, especially when we get into certain questions about morals and ethics right because now there really is no right answers other than there is a perhaps a set of principles and if we want to live our life by those principles then these actions would seem to be closer to those principles than those actions. But, you know, the classic trolley problem, which is a trolley is speeding down out of control down a set of tracks. There is a Y fork in the tracks. On one track, there is a person bound and helpless on the track. They're stuck or something. On the other track, there are five people who are aware and, you know, Essentially, if you, you as the person standing at the switch, you can send the trolley down one of these two tracks. If you send it down the, the track with the one, guaranteed you're going to kill them. If you send it down the other track where the five people are standing, there's a good chance that many of them will get out of the way, but there's still a 20% chance that you'll kill any one of them, right? So technically, all five could die if they all roll poorly on their dice roll. That one's going to die. There's a 20% chance for each one of those five that they might die. Do you take the guaranteed death over there or do you take the possibility of no deaths but the possibility of more than one death, possibly five deaths, 
Which do you choose? Mm. Philosophers have wrestled with this problem for, for, for millennia, quite frankly. And where it gets really fun is now you're a programmer who's working on a self-driving car and the car is faced with that choice. What do you program the car to do? And this is why I think philosophy well, is super important. It depends if that program running is based on if it's driven by AI. <laughs> if it's driven by AI, do you really program it? Or well, you have it... to train it. Remember, all AI is trained, right? The the way we do AI right now is all with training models, right? We 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 set up a, what is considered the preferential um, outcome, right? When we do image training, for example, we say these images, in fact, have have dogs in them, and these images do not. And the AI learns based on that training feedback what is a dog and what isn't, right? And it does that by just doing thousands and thousands and thousands of repetitions. Yeah. But we still have to train it. We still have it. It didn't evolve out of nothingness. And we have right? to train it without. We have to try to train it without being biased, which is very difficult to do. Which so. brings up a whole slew of other philosophical questions, which is why I love this space. I absolutely love this space because everywhere you go, anywhere you turn, anything that goes on in the world has philosophy at its core. And if you know how to see it, if you know how to live within it, you're never bored. I mean, political science, yeah, economics, you know, history, anthropology, sociology, computer science, it's all philosophy. It all, and this is why one of the most famous quotes about philosophy is that all of civilization is but a footnote on Plato. I never heard that, but I think yep. I understand. Yeah. Let's think I was, like that. <laughs> my degree in college was international relations, which is a smorgasbord of all of the liberal arts. And most of the liberal arts stem from you know, more of this direct philosophical inquiry. Um, and so, yeah, you spend a lot of time thinking about all these different things and thinking about how they affect things and so on and so on and so on. Um, a lot of the folks that, uh, I, you know, my peers in college who were computer science, no, nope, they learned about big O notation and they learned about, um, uh, you know, how electrical signal is carried across wires to, to do networks. They haven't, they haven't addressed any of these philosophical questions. And in many cases, a lot of computer scientists are woefully unprepared to deal with some of these issues. And we can see that. We can see based on how the metaverse and AI and some of these other things have rolled out, social media even, people are creating things and they have no idea what they're building. And if they would engage with the liberal arts more, they would have better ways, better models to predict some of this stuff. But they don't because everybody says liberal arts is crap. We should all be doing STEM. No, fundamentally disagree. I think we should be doing much more in the way of liberal arts. I think we should be teaching philosophy to kindergartners, quite frankly. Your two-year-old, ask them, encourage them to ask questions, encourage them to ask why. Encourage them to just keep asking why. And you're going to get frustrated because they're going to reach a point where you don't have the answer. And here's the thing. Two-year-olds really don't care about the answers. In many cases, what they're looking for is just engage. But if you shut down them asking why, by the time they hit five, they've lost that critical curiosity that is the hallmark of every philosopher, of every scientist, right? Encourage them and just say, hey, I don't know the answer to that. That's okay. Philosophers are comfortable with ambiguity. And if your child isn't, hey, that that's, you know, that's part for them to wrestle with, but encourage them to see if they can find their own answers why. And now they've really started down an interesting path because now in some cases they can come up with their own reasons or they start looking for ways to prove the reasons. And one or the other, they're either going down the path of religion or science. Either is a legitimate path to go down. But it all starts with asking that fundamental question, why? And asking the questions about the world around us and asking questions about how, you know, how do we know and so forth. Philosophy is about the asking of questions more than it is about the arrival at answers. 
If I were a Jehovah's Witness, I would skip your house and move on. Yeah. To <laughs> you know, I I I don't think we've seen one come by in quite a while. So yeah, maybe they, maybe they I'm in probably a made notes. somewhere. Just just skip this one. Just just don't bother. Just yeah. skip. I have a feeling they talked to you before, and they're like, "We weren't prepared, and we probably will never be prepared." Let's yeah. just. Oh, I used to me. make when I was in confirmation class as a kid. I used to drive the pastor nuts, absolutely nuts, because I would derail what the material he had to go over by asking all of these questions. And he got to the point where he's just like, "Look, if you want to do this, that's fine. Come by my office on any other day, and we'll have this debate." But I need to get through all this so that you guys can be confirmed and your parents will be happy. My dad was the, pat, was the president of the congregation, and the two of them would frequently be at loggerheads. So me arguing with the pastor was just, you know, icing on the cake. Um, very sharp guy. Extremely smart. I loved our debates. Um, but it didn't, it didn't, I mean, the other kids in the confirmation class loved it when we would debate because they could just sit back and do whatever the hell they wanted. Yeah. Right, they could doodle or they could do their school homework or whatever. Um, it's frustrating sometimes living in this space because a lot of people they don't want they don't want to just keep asking questions. They want you know they want to answer. Well, what should I do? A or B? I don't know. Well, that's not helpful, but it is because we can. Blah, 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 blah. And they're like, whatever, dude. And they walk away. So, on that note, I really appreciate you giving your time or donating your yeah. time. And uh, we went from uh, DevRel to philosophy, and then we drilled into uh, well, Stoicism. Is yeah. that an accurate yeah. term? Stoicism and religion and all all kinds of stuff. And yeah, yeah it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what the edit, the post editing looks like. <laughs> I have a feeling there really... probably going to be separate videos. <laughs> yeah, and that's fine. My co-host is going to flip out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wandered all over the place, but you know, sometimes that's where the conversation wants to go. Yeah. Well, again, like I, I really respect and value your time. You can send me the invoice and uh thank you. No worries, man. No worries.